This morning we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1. And while you're turning there, we have the honor to have the mayor of Whitehall with us this morning. <laughs> My brother-in-law, who also teaches, what, what, what's that east side, east, what is it? Uh, east, <coughs> east Middle School. East Middle School. So, we're honored to have him with us this morning. Glad to have him. Thursday night, actually this has been a hell week for me, as a lot of them are, because the, I, I just come to the conclusion that stuff's not a coincidence. There are attacks of the enemy when you're doing God's work, and all of you can probably attest to that. But I had this week, of course my, you know, the washer went out, the dryer's on its last leg, the furnace went out Thursday, or all week, so we went, you know, had to mess around with that. And my back went out again. And then I get th Thursday at 4 o'clock, I find out that I must have forgot to pay the water bill. So the water's off. So I had to get my dad to jump over there by 4.30. Hopefully they'd get the water on Friday so that we would have, and I mean everything and more. I mean, that's just the, there's more. But, and I'm just like, man, I came, not that I came this close, but I felt like just calling everybody Thursday and canceling. Because I just, in fact, I have a watch. It's a Garmin watch that connects to your phone, and it does your stress, you know. And it said you had no rest, awaking, my waking hours. I looked at it, and nothing, the stress level was to the roof all day Thursday. And I can prove it. You can see it. There was no blue, which is blue is rest, orange is stress, all orange. I mean, it was just a hard week. So Thursday, I, I show up Thursday night, and um, and God just took over. And I, I said things Thursday night I hadn't planned to say. So And I'm saying all that because through much tribulation, we inherit the kingdom of God. So God is always able to sustain us through the rough times, through, and you probably didn't even catch that Thursday was that bad for me as I was teaching because God just took it over. So today's message is part two of Thursday night because we, we got into some things that, that I want to elaborate on today that I believe is very, very foundational to who we are as a people and must be said and taught. And so I want to do that. So we're going to start in Ephesians chapter one. And if you got your outline there, the title today is what we've been talking about. I just titled it, We Start at the Finish Line. So, subtitle is The Testimony of Jesus is the Spirit of Prophecy. That's a scripture we're going to look at here. What does that mean? I've heard that scripture talked about a lot. just went over my head because I just never really had the spirit to give me anything on it. I kind of knew what it meant, but it really didn't have a full understanding till this week. We'll talk about that. So let's look at our introduction. What does a society do with the facts that are presented to it? I'm not talking about what your imagination come up. I mean, if, if, the, if we know the color code of what's red, yellow, blue, white, we look up into the sky and see that it's blue, what are we to do with that but believe that the sky is blue? Elementary, right? What does a society do with facts? Without facts, truth just dissipates, it disappears. Without facts, you reason according to your imagination. But facts actually put pressure on us to do something with them. Either we can deny what's in front of our eyes, or we can believe what we're seeing, whether our minds can be wrapped around the truth or not. So the reformers, now we're looking at church, you can take science and religion and do all, because science has always given us facts, and the Bible gives us facts. So the reformers regarding the Bible determined years ago our church fathers to let the truth declare itself to them, and they had to deal with what was in the word, whether they liked it or not. Like you have science for all these years believed in evolution. And so just recently, they're coming up and saying, look, the people back in the old days that understood evolution, creation or evolution, that they went through evolution route, they, they said this was the science, this is how they saw it. But what they had, Darwinism, what they had during that time, and they said that we applaud Darwin for what he did, 
but he didn't have the facts that we now have today. He was only dealing with what he had, but today he wouldn't believe in evolution. So you've got a lot of science happening right now that are debunking evolution. Now, they're not jumping on the creation bandwagon. They're just like, we're not going to the God side, but we can't do Darwinism anymore. So they're like in a tailspin. And then there are people that just see the facts of science and still deny or believe. So it depends on what their mindset is. It depends on what their ideology is. It depends on a lot of things. What they're going to do with that fact that's breathing down their neck. That's science, and that's in the physical world. What about the church? The Bible declares truths about us as a people, and because we can't wrap our minds around and we try to circumvent these truths and come up with our own reasoning and what we think and feel and so forth and so on. So, we're, so science, going back to our notes, science refers to the kind of knowledge which is forced upon us when we are true to the facts we are up against. Here we do not think in the way we want to think, but in the way we have to think. Now, now look at that. When you're looking at facts, and you're a truth seeker, and you're like, hey, look, I, I'm, I'm putting everything on the table because I, I want to know what is true and what is not. And looking at the notes again, it says, the facts that are forced upon us, in other words, facts put pressure on us to believe in them, or we circumvent them. Here we do not think in the way we want to think, but in the way we have to think. And I'm talking about the church now. Because I shared some truths Thursday night that just was a sidebar. And I know that the church has taken certain truths and are ignoring them because of the culture and the way our culture's going, which is in the opposite direction of the Bible and God. And then the church is in the, trying to be relevant to the world, has to now do we stay on these old truths or do we change with society and the church is changing with society and these are these are orthodox beliefs that the church has always believed now if you would say to people what we're going through let's say for instance you take somebody who's who's dead and gone who's pastored or religious leaders and you say what the church is facing today, they wouldn't believe. There's no way. Like, for instance, how many genders do we have now? Somebody, somebody 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 would go, You're, you, got, you mean our society is going to go that route? And you can see what, where all of this, these traditional values and principles and truths that not only were we raised with, but that are derived out of the Bible are being challenged today, and the church is wavering on things you cannot believe that they're wavering over. Now, let me say that again, because the Bible's presenting a, a bunch of truths to us that demand that we believe them or reject them. And you and I do not have the option to think whatever we want when we've got it black and white. Now, I know there's a lot of gray areas, and that's why I don't deal with gray areas. Because that's, up, that's between you and God to work out those great areas. But I'm talking about fundamental truths that the church has now can't, can't even um, stay rooted in. So here we do not think in the way we want to think. We don't have that option in the Bible. But in the way we have to think. Scientific thinking is not free thinking. And neither is religious thinking. You don't, you can't, do you know how many people, and it is amazing to me, it's happened all my life. It happens to every preacher that you get a person coming through that door and they have never read the Bible or that they just read it periodically. But they actually come in here and, and put me or this word on trial and then get mad because I don't believe what they think the Bible says. And they get upset and mad and it's not even their, their call. They don't even know how to preach the Bible, teach them. But they've already got formulated how they think God is or how the Word is. And when you challenge their reasoning, and their reasoning is not derived from facts, but what they want God to be, how they want God to be. And people just, and they're like, I'm out. And you don't have any, any basis for your belief, and yet you're going to challenge truth. It's amazing.
how, and I was like, oh, that, that's how, and I, that's fine because I know how, how some people are. They think they're theologians, and they're not. They they're not even close to, to that. And they'll make judgments on what they hear without doing their own homework because they've already reasoned it out. So there is no free thinking in the church. You're not a free thinker. You can't derive. Do you remember me telling you there's a Jethro Tull album back in the 70s? I mean, it was amazing. My uncle had the album. And I was over at his house and we're looking at it. I'm like in the fourth grade. And I turned the album over. And I think it's Aqualung, if I'm not mistaken, the album Aqualung, if somebody wants to check me out. And you turn the, bio, you turn the album cover over, and he had a little take on creation, first so many verses of the Bible. And he said, in the beginning was man, not God, in the beginning was man, and man created God, and man created God in his own image. Not God creating man in his own, and he, and he, he was doing a flip on it, but there was a lot of truth in that. We create God after how we want him to be, according to how we think truth ought to be. And church is, be, is beginning to create God after their image. Not us after his image, but God could not hate this group, or God could not forgive this group, or whatever thing you think God should or shouldn't do, you begin to formulate how God is without looking at the scriptures. God is not hiding himself from us he reveals himself in fact that's what the holy spirit jesus said the holy spirit was here to do reveal god to us so that we wouldn't be in the dark of who he is and what we are to believe about him so there is no free thinking in the world today and yet almost every christian is a free thinker does anyone want to read the bible so they they want to formulate how they think god is and I remember again. I, I was working for Christian Television, and we we I was nine, I was 18 years old. We were doing a uh, going to this lady's house who had some miracle happen. I don't remember what it was, but we went there with the cameras to interview her and do a story on her. And so she's Catholic, and we're sitting there, and I'm seeing Mary here and Mary there and a cross here and a cross. I mean, the, the, it was a religious relic. The whole house was a religious relic. That's fine. No big deal. So we're sitting there talking, and um, like I said, I'm 18 years old. I, I, I have I have no filter at that point. I haven't created a filter, so I'm just we're talking about the Bible, and I'm, I'm we're talking about Mary, we're talking about this, that, and the other. And I'm like, where do you get that when the Bible clearly says this? And she says, Oh, well, I don't know what the Bible says, but my priest says this. I'm like, Yeah, but but what, what about the Bible? Well, I don't I don't. I don't it didn't, and, and I didn't know anything. But that's where a lot of Catholics are today. And I'm not di dishing, dissing Catholics because Protestants are just as bad. I'm simply saying these people are not reading the Bible to find out who God is and what he says about a matter. They're going, and she clearly told me, I don't, I don't, I don't know what that Bible says, and it really doesn't matter. My priest says this. And I found out years later that's where most of the church is, even in Protestants. I don't care what so-and-so says, John Hagee says this. I don't care what the Bible says, Benny Hinn said that. And you're not even going to find out if what these guys are saying are true. That's why I said, don't go by what I'm saying. And this is why I spend a lot of time developing scripture, so you'll see it. Don't go by what I tell you. Go by what the Word can prove to you. What the Holy Spirit reveals to you through the Word. So there is no free thinking today. Today in the church world, people don't consider the truth um, found in God's word. They want to be the free thinkers and determine it the way they want. So the Bible is crystal clear how God sees things. He is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Yet his own could not handle the truth and began to reason according to how they want it to be. Today the church has lost its truth, truth compass. And the culture is dictating to us what we are to believe because of the PC crowd. So the church is at a crossroads in many ways. From what, we are, what, from what we call sin to what we don't, what we accept that lies in the enemies, to that we have no clue what Jesus finished and God's eternal purpose. So there's a lot the church has to fix if we're going to be light and salt in the world. Not relevant. I don't care to be relevant. That's the problem. The church wants to be relevant and ends up having to compromise its beliefs so it can be acceptable to the crowd, to the culture. So, number one, got your outline there? 
Now, according to Ephesians 1, look what it says here. Chapter 1, verse 4. If you got your Bibles. Now, I'm going to be reading out of the Amplified, so it's not going to completely follow probably with what you have. So just listen. Even as in His love, talking about God, in His love. Now, watch this. He chose us, actually picked us out for Himself as His own in Christ when? Before the foundation of the world. Now, here's... Going up here, we've been talking about the Trinity. This is the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You are in the Godhead. Jesus said in John 14, 20, I, in that day, as I am in the Father, one, you will be in me, one. So we are in the Godhead, John 14, 20 and John 14, 23. So you find out right there that we are in the Godhead. Now, before the foundation of the world, it says he chose us where? In Christ. How did he choose me before he created heaven and earth? How did he? I, I, I didn't get born until 1963. And if the earth is 6,000 years old, or at least that's when he created man 6,000 years ago, even before that, the Bible's letting us in that he chose us. That means he knew who you were. He knew your name. He knew everything about you before he started creating the world. So that means somewhere in the mind of God, however you want to legitimize it, in the mind of God, I was in Him, in the Godhead, before He even created heaven and earth. Chose us. Now this is, this is huge. That we should be holy, set apart for Him, blameless, in His sight, even above reproach. So I was made perfect before He created me. In other words, before something hits the... Before something hits Walmart, it was already perfect, perfected at the factory on the assembly line. So before it left the factory, it's working. Now what happens in the UPS truck or the tractor trailer? Before it gets there, if somebody drops it, whatever, and it gets to Walmart damaged, you buy it and it's broke. But it did not leave that factory if everything's right. It could have left the factory, but it shouldn't have. All right? So that's where the analogy falls short. But let's just say everything that leaves the factory works until it gets to Walmart or until it gets in your hands and you take it home and break it. Before you were created, God did not create anybody broke. Amen. So why are we broke when we're born into this world? Because that's not how he created us. You know the answer to this. Adam and Eve in the garden sin, And sin entered into the world. And according to Romans 5, sin entered into man. And man is born into sin with a nature that's flawed. Okay? That's what happened. So between the time that God created heaven and earth... I don't know how long this ago. This, this is eternity past. So we're talking, this could be a million years ago. I don't know. But by the time he comes and starts, this is eternity. And meaning there is no time or space in eternity. Time and space is created here when he creates heaven and earth. So you, in his mind, in eternity, was perfect. In his mind, he created you. Then he, then he brought you down into time and space and whatever date you were born. That's when you entered into this. Does that make sense? Yes. Then, because of what Adam did 6,000 years ago, Christ comes 2,000 years ago and fixes, called the cross, what Adam did 6,000 years ago. So 6,000 years ago, Adam fell and blew the plan God had thousands and maybe a million years ago. Is this making sense? So God created you perfect, but when you came down here and entered into the realm of time and space, because of what Adam did, you're born broken because of sin. You're born into sin. Ephesians 2 tells us that. By nature, we are children of wrath. Jesus said, your father's the devil. Now, so we need Jesus to fix what Adam did to us. So this was 6,000 years ago that happened. He fixes us 2,000 years ago. Okay? Make sense? Now, I'm sitting here probably, 
a couple weeks ago. And I shared this with Stevie and totally forgot. We were at the gym and I said, hey, let me tell you Revelation just got this week. It was two or three weeks ago. It, and I totally forgot until Thursday night. And I want to I wanna develop it a little more. So watch this. I'm born, I'm going to use me, 1963. All right? So God, in his mind, already thought of me. What did he say to Jeremiah? I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. And before you were in your mother's womb, I already called you to be a prophet. So God already mapped out his life for him, always mapped out what he was going to be, and there was nothing he could do but just walk it out and accept it. And that's how it works out for us. God already planned us, purposed us, called us what we would be, and the path that we were already mapped out to walk in. So that happened for me. And then that's, who knows, eons of time back, past. 6,000 years ago, Adam sinned. Blew it, and that's what the whole Old Testament is, people blowing it left and right, coming under judgment and condemnation. Christ comes 2,000 years ago, fixes everything, and now, watch. So, God did this before 1963. Right or wrong? Adam sinned before 1963. Jesus came and fixed everything before 1963. So what happened here has no relevancy to me at all once I'm saved. And I am what he already determined me to be. Fixed me. So whatever, the, whatever comes out of the factory, if it got dropped, he fixed it. So when I come in in 1963, all this is already done. This was done before I was born. He blew it before I was born. So in other words, whatever plan God had for me was before I was born. Adam blew my plan up because he sinned and sin entered into the world before I was born. So I'm screwed before I'm born. But Christ comes, fixes everything. So when I'm born into this world, I have to find out this truth, accept it, and then none of this matters to me except what he did on that cross. And when that hit me that week, and I, actually I shared it with him, I'm like, man, wait a minute. This means then we start at the finish line. See, the church brings you in and says, this is what's wrong with you. And then the church takes the Bible and starts browbeating you, hammering you with do-do this, don't do that, and, they're, and you are their project. And it's their job to fix you. You're already fixed. Once you, receive, once you see this truth and accept what Jesus did, you're recreated, born again, born anew, and you, start, you get to start your new life at the finish line and... You don't come in here for me to fix you. But Greg, i got these problems. Yeah, you do. But it's a result of an unrenewed mind. See, your spirit gets born again. You're a new man once you accept Christ. But your mind doesn't. So in other words, let's say somebody comes in here and they get born again. So they leave as a new creation. That means they have a new spirit. But their mind didn't get changed. So, my job, or our job, is to preach and teach the truth and let them know who they now are because of what he fixed. Without this, this gets, this, we come out of the factory broke. And then all we'll do, if he didn't come, all we would do is just have to put up with each other's faults and failures. Well, I'm gay and proud of it. Okay, well, then that's because that's, that's what happened. Or I'm, a, I'm an alcoholic. Yep, that's what happened. I'm, I'm this. I'm that. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a man. I'm a woman beater. Yep, that's what I am. I'm, I'm materialistic. Yep, that's what I am. This is, we would all have sin in common. If this, if this didn't happen, we're screwed. But the fact that God's plan was never for you to end up broke, Adam broke us, Christ comes and fixes us, we share the truth, people believe it, they get born again, and now they get to go back to God's original plan because of what he did. So I'm not broke anymore. So you're not my project when you come in here. You're finished. You're done, complete, perfected forever by one sacrifice. My job is to reveal to you who you now are. Uh, you're not my project. You're fixed. Amen. You're not. Every I would say 99.9% .9 of the church is trying to fix you. You start at the finish line. You're not getting somewhere. You start 
You come out of the factory now fixed, but your mind doesn't know how fixed you are. Now, I shared that. Okay, now that's recap from Thursday night. Here's where the message begins, now that I you know, brought you up to speed of where we were Thursday night. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting some comments back. And obviously, probably everybody, and this is the big hotbed topic, as some are, is homosexuality. What's the church going to do with homosexuality? Well, I know what the church used to do with it. Condemn it. Condemn the people. Condemn the sin. Condemn everything. I get that. The Bible says it's a sin. But you've got people coming out that are on Christian television. If I said their names, and the reason why I'm not going to say their names is because they may have changed their opinion and they don't believe it anymore. So I don't know where they all stand. So I'm not going to say names, but if I said their names, their household names, you'd know who they are. And would say things like, well, homosexuality is no longer a sin, or it's supposed to be received, and this, that, and the other. And that, and that is from the pressure culture is putting on us to accept that as well as other things that the Bible clearly says is sin. Now, I'm not saying we condemn the person, and I don't, I don't even like pointing out particular sins. Because if I point out the homosexuals, then I've got to point out my own sins. And all we're going to do is sit here and point out each other's sins, and we can't get... And he already fixed that. We just don't know how to preach fixed. We keep making people projects. We don't know how to preach God's original intent that he fixed who they now are. And the reason they're not is because their mind is not renewed to it yet. And they're believing the lies of the old man. Okay, I know we've talked about that. So I'm sitting, and so after Thursday, I'm like, I cannot believe there are still people out there willing to forego persecution. You know, when Jesus said, when I show up, I'm going to divide husband from wife, kid from mother, dad from, you know, the division. He says, I'm coming with a sword. Now, what is the sword is symbolic of? Truth, the word. So when I preach the word, there's always going to be that possibility that I offend somebody with the truth because they want to be a free thinker. Well, I've just decided it's not a sin anymore because if I say it's a sin, I'm going to lose my son, I'm going to lose my daughter, I'm going to lose my place in, in society if I say this, that, or the other. Well, welcome to Christianity. Welcome to what Jesus said would happen to us if we stood for the truth called persecution. But see, we don't want to get persecuted. See, if I've got a lawyer over here and a doctor over here and, 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 and a mayor back there, and if I make this particular statement, I may lose them. So now I've got to cave into society to keep the people. Well, Jesus wouldn't even keep his own disciples because he said to Peter, are you offended? There's the door. He was willing to let Peter. If you don't like this, there's the door. And he, his truth got him crucified on the cross. His own people crucified him. We shouldn't expect anything less. Hopefully people will have their eyes open and believe the truth. But I also got to understand there are going to be those who divide, who get offended. But dealing with the more, more if I, you know, I'm just not picking on homosexuality. You take any sin. But because this is the hotbed topic, we got to know how to deal with this in accordance to the God. This is the gospel right here. This is the gospel. Of, this is the good news. The church has never preached the good news. All we know how to do is, oh, you're, you're, you've got that sin, and we know, we know how to condemn. Anybody can do this. Discern what's right or wrong, and even that is according to your standard, what's right and wrong. But you can discern right and wrong, and you can make a judgment on it. Anybody can do that. That's wrong, and this is what I feel about it. You do it every day. This is right, and this is what I feel about it. This is wrong, this is what I feel about it. Anybody can do that. But what in the church is notorious for that? Because every church has its own rules. You go to this church down there, you can't wear jeans. You go to this church up there, you can't smoke cigarettes. You go to this church down here, alcohol better not touch your lips. You go to this church down there, you can't listen to that music. You go to that church over there, you can't go to the theater. I'll tell you a true story. A guy named Joseph Parker which you probably don't know him, but you do know Charles Spurgeon. These are two contemporaries in London, had gigantic churches, and they were friends. And they said to each other, hey, let's switch pulpits. I'll preach at your church. You preach at mine, kind of mix things up. Cool. 
So while Parker was at Spurgeon's church, he found out Spurgeon smoked a cigar. And he got offended. So Spurgeon's at Parker's church, and Spurgeon finds out Joseph Parker attends the theaters. This is back in the 1800s. Attends the theaters. Late 1800s. And he got offended. And they were no longer friends. Because one smoked tobacco and the other one went to the theater. And these are, these are huge men in our history. So, anyway, I'm, let, let, me, let me get back to this. So, I'm amazed that those are those gray areas. But when the Bible is clear on certain things, then it doesn't matter what I think. i got to believe it. And if I make you unhappy because I call it a sin, but if I can't call that a sin, I'm gonna ref and I'm again, homosexuality, if I can't call that a sin, then I can't no longer call murder a sin. I can't call rape a sin. Because now we just don't understand what sin is, and the Bible is clear on what sin is. Is it not? So I understand the dilemma parents are having with their kids coming out of the closet. And I mentioned this Thursday, and out of the blue, wasn't planning on it, watch how God works. And I even come up, and even afterwards, you all looked at me like, where'd that come from? And I'm like, I don't know, to myself, when I talked about somebody coming out of the closet on Christmas Day. Remember I'd be saying that? Where did that come? I don't know where that came from. I get an email from somebody saying, hey, that kind of happened in my life. My Not that she came out of the closet, or he, I can't remember if it was he or she, came out of the, but they wanted to bring, they, they told us that they were gay and they were bringing their, their partner on Christmas Day. And they shared with me how that was what happened, and I wasn't playing. See, God's trying to say something. These are not coincidences. I didn't, I didn't know why I said that. Even after I said it, I thought, i got to get off of this. I don't know where that came from. But it was inspired by God to say it. What are we going to do if your daughter comes to you and she's got this problem? Maybe she's addicted to something. Or maybe a, a, a son comes and he wants to come out of the closet. Or something happens. Or maybe they become an alcoholic. Or, or something's going on within that person. Or your wife comes to you and says, I, I'm, I'm in love with somebody else. See, these are all things that people deal with every day. And the church doesn't know how to relate those problems to the gospel. All we know how to do is condemn the people that are in the wrong. And Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn people. I didn't come to condemn the sick. Do you go, if you... Has it ever happened to you that you went to the hospital in the ambulance and was met at the door and they're yelling at you for having a heart attack? I can't believe you are having a heart attack. Come on in. Get, you know, and make you feel, no, man, they're on top helping you. The church, you come in with problems and they want to judge you and condemn you, not tell you what God's original intent for you would be. And that's not who you are anymore because he fixed it. We treat people as if they're still broken like he never came. It's not who they... See, so what do I do with somebody if I have... And again, I'm dealing with something that's huge here. Well, how do I deal with somebody, a, a son or a daughter, or even if, if you... I've even had this. True story. person's been married to somebody for years and then they come out of the closet. What do you do if you find out your wife's been a lesbian for 20 years? And she's wanting to move on. This I was watching Whetstone months ago, and he said, look, if the church doesn't, this is, this is what's happening. And if the church can't deal and know how to relate to it, we're not doing our job. All the church knows how to do is condemn and judge. Or... It's not a sin anymore. Come on in. We don't know the middle ground on how to deal because we don't know the true gospel. If you knew the true gospel, it wouldn't be hard to deal with people. If, if, if one of you belly up 
and get into heavy sin, do you know what most of the church will do? Either kick you out or ignore you, marginalize you, and then you'll just go away because we're ignoring you now. Because we can't have that kind of stuff here. That's not how Jesus came for the sinner. I mean, they find Jesus and he's got prostitutes hanging in his feet. He's, he's, he's with the mob having dinner. Think, read the Bible. He's with tax collectors. They're considered like a mob type people. The religious people hated tax collectors and he ate dinner with them. And the church hated prostitutes and he let them hang around him. He let one wash his feet. He did not come to condemn. He came to enter into our sin and show us that's not who we are anymore because on the cross I fixed that. Well, I've got the passions and desires. Once you understand you're not that, I'm telling you, those passions leave. It is that because the Bible's clear. The truth sets you free. Not your willpower, self-effort, going to, going to a group, a 12-step program. Those are all works. And that's, that's Jekyll trying to fix Hyde when they're both the same guy. you got to know who you now are in Christ. That new creation that you're born anew, born again. And once you realize, I'm not that anymore. Now, if you think that's crazy, and I, I, you know some of us may have not heard this, Stockholm Syndrome. I know you've heard this, but some haven't, so let me say it. Stockholm Syndrome, I can take a, a, an eighth grade girl who knows her mom and dad, has a healthy family, and I can kidnap her, and I can take her to some basement somewhere, and over a period of time, I can convince her that she loves me. And then when they go to try to get her, and they've got me in handcuffs, she's on my side. How the hell does that happen? Brainwash. She thinks she's somebody, now she's not. And that's what's happened. You still think you're here. And Jesus said the truth sets you free. And you go to church to, so people can tell you that ain't that guy that's been, you've been in his basement for three years, he ain't your dad. And she's got to go to counseling to get her head back on do you remember, what was that lady's name in the 70s that got, that got um, abducted and she started robbing banks? Patty Hearst. She, she got brainwashed, supposedly, and began to start robbing, robbing banks with these guys. Because they brainwashed. And then we talked about phantom pain. There are people that get their arms cut off, and 20 years later, their brain's still trying to move an arm that hasn't been there in 20 years. Hey, brain, we lost that limb 20 years ago. Quit, quit trying to scratch it. Quit trying to move it. It ain't there anymore. And that's the problem with people today. I'm a homosexual. No, you're not. That's a phantom pain, using the analogy, of who you used to be in Adam, but in Christ, he set you free. That's not who you are. So, But because we think that's who we are, they put us in the rehab. They put us in the program. The, the truth sets us free, not programs. So the mind has a hard time comprehending what Jesus did as the mind has a hard time. That arm ain't there no more. Or the girl who's in the eighth grade, that's my captor, not my dad. I'm telling you, it's all in the mind. That's why Paul said, be renewed in the mind for transformation to take place. Is that what it says? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing your mind. And the church is supposed to be setting you free with truth, not trying to change you, because you start at the finish line. You start perfect. You don't start broken. In Christ, you are now perfect, and it's going to take years for you, your brain, to catch up with what he did 2,000 years ago, which is to restore God's original tent for your life before the foundation of the world. I spent way too much time on that. Go to, with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. Ezekiel chapter 37. And look at verse 1. Let me change this translation because I'm not going to read that in the Amplified. 
All right, watch this. This is the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. So he was in the spirit realm. Watch this. He's in the spirit realm in eternity looking from God's perspective on what's happening on earth. Okay? This is before the cross. This is the Old Testament. So Ezekiel is in this realm. And he sees a valley full of dry bones. Verse 2. God caused me to pass among them round about. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, many bones, and they were very dry. They're bleached from the sun. They're very dry. They've been out there a long time. Now look what, what God asks this guy in verse 3. Son of man, can these bones live? Now think about you're in the woods and you see a deer carcass that's been there forever and basically it's just bones. And God says to you, can that deer live? Well, number one, he ain't going to tell that to me. But if he did, I'm like, really? Come on, God. We would say no. What do you mean, can that deer live? It's been out here. There's no skin on it. It's dry bones. Watch, verse 3. Can these bones live? And he answered, because he's talking to God, Lord, anything's possible with you, basically, but I don't know. You know. I don't know. You know. Verse 4. Well, here's what I want you to do, Ezekiel. Prophesy over these bones. And say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear what? Culture? Society? What's, MB, what, what's CNN saying today? Nope. He says, hear the word of the Lord. Here's the word of the Lord. God's original intent. Okay? Verse 5. God says to him, I'm going to cause breath to enter these dry bones that they may live. I'm going to put flesh on them. And they're going to grow back, cover their skin, and put breath in them that they may live and you will know that I am Lord. So, so okay, so what does Ezekiel do? I prophesied as I was commanded. And what did he prophesy? The word of the Lord. And there was noise and rattling. And these bones came together. Flesh came on them. Breath entered them. Verse 9. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Come from the four winds, of, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may come to life. So I prophesied, again, as I'm commanded, and the breath, this is verse 10, came into them, and they came, and look what happened. They went from dry bones to life and stood on their feet an exceedingly great army. So going back to before time, you think that was God's plan for that army to be dead and dry bones laying there? No army? That's not God's plan. God's plan was them to be a vibrant, strong army. But they come in through the system of sin, go through Adam, come out, and end up dry bones. Were they created dry bones here? Did he come to fix dry bones? Did he create? Walk with me on this. This is common sense. Was dry bones created here? How did it become dry bones? Because of this. Who fixed the dry bones? So that it could be the army God created it to be. That's exactly... Now that is what the church should be doing to everybody walking through there. That is not who you are. And I'm going to prophesy from the finished work who you now are according to what he chose you to be before the foundation of the world. I'm not going to pout, browbeat you over your sin. I'm going to prophesy not who you were from Adam, but who you were from the beginning. Now, whether you want to believe that or not, that's up to you. There's no condemnation. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation. So if I'm not to condemn people or judge people, which we love to do, what am I supposed to do? prophesy the finished work, which is the word of the Lord, over that person, what? Who they now are because of what he did on the cross. Amen. That's good. That's good. So you, 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 rather than sit there and fight with your kids and try to use your manipulations and your willpower to overcome them and go to this program, get some help over there, read this book. Read, what did God do for that son or daughter? That's 
who they really are, what they're living is a lie, this is who they really are because he fixed it now. If he didn't fix it, you have no business telling them anything. He has no business telling dry bones to live if God doesn't fix it. So Christ comes and fixes all of us. But we don't know that truth, so we get into problems. We're still living out this realm and not out of this one. We're living out of the lie, not the truth. So you say to your son who comes and wants to come out of the closet, and they say to you, I'm this way, and you're like, okay, sorry, that's not who you are. What do you mean? And then you tell them the gospel. You, we, most Christians can't. Th this is so elementary, but it's not to most Christians. They don't know what Jesus did according to what he already planned and how they got into this mess. They don't know this. And the church doesn't know this. So this is how you talk to people. Come in here. Well, I, I'm not called. I had this friend that I set... I don't know how many years with. Met him once a week. And his wife kept calling him an alcoholic, an alcoholic, an alcoholic. And they had problems all the time. And I said, well, dude, how many beers do you drink? And what, what amount? And again, if I give an amount, then you're going to make a rule out of it. I'm, and he gave me the amount. And I'm like, dude, that ain't an alcoholic. But even if you were, you're not. And he believed it. And that was back in 2011. And here we are, 2019, and he's, and he's doing great. Amen. But if he listened to his wife, he'd be at a meeting all the time. He'd be addicted to a meeting. And probably falling back into the off the wagon or on the wagon, however that works out. But no, you're not that. But when you got people telling you, how many people, how many parents have told their kids, you're never going to grow up to be anything? Because you're talking to them out of, out of sin, out of Adam, the old Adam, the first Adam. You find out, oh my God, honey, you're perfect. And you start at the age of when they can comprehend language, you start prophesying. And didn't you do that with your kids? Didn't we have this conversation a while back? Um, you, you begin to decree and declare this. God's original intent over them. Well, but he just loses his temper and he gets mad. He does, that, that, no. That's, that's the result of this that he fixed. That they need their mind renewed. What are you going to say? You're going to, you're going to tell them they're this? Well, I can't believe you're this. I can't believe you. I can't believe. No, quit can't believe and Start believing what he did and say what he did. Now, if that son gets offended or daughter gets offended because you told them what God's original intent for them was, there's nothing else you can do. Share the truth and hope the Holy Spirit opens their eyes or they can open their eyes, however that works out. If not, you can still love them. No one ever said to hate. No one ever said to hate people in their sin. No one ever said that. For God so loved the world and while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Ain't no hate there. You love them where they're at, but that's not enough because you've got to introduce now this truth. And hopefully the scales fall off their eyes and they can put a new lens on and see themselves as God sees them because that's the problem. If they see themselves as the devil has lied to them, we're trying to get them to see themselves as who they really are before the foundation of the world. Does that make sense? So go with me now to Revelation chapter 19 I'm running out of time which is usual let me let me finish this up here real quick revelation last book in the bible not hard to find what i say 19, 19. Then I fell at his feet, verse 10, to worship him. This is John falling at the feet of Jesus to worship him. But he said to me, do not do that. Well, no, that might not have been Jesus there. Who I don't know who he's talking to in 19. I'm pulling that out of context. So I'm, but I want you to see the scripture. Then I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, do not do that. I am a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the... Now watch. 
and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Your brother, are we holding the testimony? Of, what is the testimony of Jesus? Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is what? And Moses says in Numbers, I wish that all God's people would prophesy. Prophesy is declaring forth God's word. That's all it is. If God says, um, tell that person I love them, and you go up and say, hey, God told me to tell you he loves you, you're prophesying. Or tell them this, that, or the other. And it's a truth that you hear in your spirit, or you get out of the word, and you declare it to somebody. That's, that's usually your prophesy. But look at here. The spirit of prophecy, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What is the testimony of Jesus? I've heard all kinds of sermons on this, over the, especially the 80s, when we had the prophetic movement. But not, I don't remember what they were, but nothing ever stuck. Until this week, as I'm, as I'm meditating on this message and God's given it to me, that scripture comes to me. I'm like, oh my God, now I get I really understand that now. Because the spirit of prophecy is me, what the testimony of Jesus is this. This is what he did, and this is who you are as a result of what he did. Restoring you back to God's original tent, already done, start to finish line. That's a testimony of Jesus, and that is what I'm to prophesy over people. My kids, my wife, my husband, whoever, I am sharing the gospel. That's the testimony of Jesus, and it is the spirit of prophecy. So going back to Ezekiel then, let's say, for instance, you don't have enough money to pay your bills. or you. Now we're talking about people. Let's talk about situations and circumstances. How are you going to handle something? Bitch and complain? As we always do? Or do we get on God's timetable and agenda and hear what God is saying about that and then get the download or find out what the Word says about it and begin to speak and declare into that situation? Because your murmuring and complaining is not fixing anything. You can criticize all day long. It's not fixing anything. Find out how He already fixed it it's not. It's all done. It's a finished work. And begin to declare the end result because you started the finish line. You don't talk about how it's unraveled. You talk about how he already fixed it, already done 2,000 years ago. This, there's no dry bones. This is, there's no such thing as dry bones here. So that's what I'm going to speak. There's no such thing as a homosexual in a believer's life. That's what I'm going to speak because he fixed that. There's no such thing as an alcohol, a Christian alcoholic, because it was fixed on, in 2,000 years ago, and it was never God's original intent for that person. So I'm going to prophesy original intent. And you prophesy that over yourself, too, because you all know we got our own problems. I got my, what we call, vices or demons or whatever. Don't sit there and go, well, that's just me. Oh, my God, that's saying that. That's not you. You're not a work in progress. Well, God just hasn't given me grace in that area yet. Oh, my God. He did 2,000 years ago. You got it. Sorry. You know, you can, you can come up with excuses, but we've got to deal with the truth. So you can't be a free thinker and want it your way because how you see it, you got to, you, the truth is putting pressure on you to think, not what you want to think, but what you have to think according to God's word. So I'm not that anymore. Because of what he did. I'm this. I am right now God's original intent. If I'm not, well, Greg, you lost your temper last week. Well, that's simply because that area, I can't see me delivered yet because of unbelief. It's the phantom pet. I'm sorry. Still think that I'm a hothead and I'm not. That's why we come together, keep talking the truth. And then transformation results. And guess what? I wake up with new drives and desires without even trying to change. Because there is no such thing as change. God already did it in me. It's my mind catching up with who I am and my identity. One more thing. Go to Numbers. Well, no, we won't go to Numbers. But let me, let me, let me close with the spies. This is huge. This is the closing, and this is huge. So we've got Israel. God wants to protect. He took them out of Egypt, through the wilderness, and wants to take them into the promised land. He sends 12 spies to, to go out and look and see what's in the promised land. Ten come back with a bad report. Now, it's God's will they beware in the promised land. 
And God says, this is what I'm doing. You're going to go into the promised land. So ten guys come back and says, there's giants in the, pro in the promised land. We're, and we're grasshoppers in their sight. God's original intent was that they be the giants. And the giants are the grasshoppers. Because if God be for you, who can be against you? If you got God on your side, I don't care how many is in the army, God wins. Now, so they come back and say, there's no way we can take that land. There's, there's giants in the land. So watch this. The testimony of the ten spies kept a whole generation out of the promised land. Let that sink in with everything I'm saying. If, you, if you'd put ten spies into the valley of dry bones, what's those ten spies going to come back out and say? Those bones can't live. They're bleached and dry. What are you saying about your life, about your family, and about your situation and circumstances. Either you're prophesying his original intent, not what you see, but what by faith he's already done, or you're going in there and taking the land. Now I'm going to tell you something. The church, traditional church, and it's the majority, are the ten spies that have kept you out of the land of deliverance and freedom. They, they, I don't know why, because they haven't because they haven't seen the truth. That's why. Truth sets you free, but if the, they're the gatekeepers, me, people like me, we're the gatekeepers. We're supposed to be the ones illuminating the the the, the promised land. You see, you're already there. They're keeping you out. God doesn't do that today. God doesn't do this today. God doesn't speak. God doesn't heal. God doesn't do this. God, they're the gatekeepers. They're the ten spies keeping you out of experience, out of encounter, of, your, of his original purpose and intent. And you've got to find people that will prophesy the good news, prophesy the gospel, prophesy. And those two came out, Caleb and Joshua, of the twelve, only two prophesied. God's word. We can take the land. Those giants are nothing. If God said, so what these ten spies were saying is, you're not delivered. Not you. Not yet. So go over there and sit down and be quiet and hope God changes you. Struggle in your sin because it's not you. Not yet. God's not working on you yet. It's not your time yet. That's what they're saying. That's what the ten spies were saying. God is not going to deliver us. He did not deliver us. He can't provide for us. He can't heal us. He can't do this. He can't do that. That's what the ten spies, and I can tell you the, the denominations that will tell you things like that, that don't believe that God's original intent and purpose was. Well, we've already said sin's okay now. If you say one sin's okay, then you've got to say all of them's okay then, and we're on a slippery slope. It's not who we are. We're not the grasshoppers looking at giants. We're giants looking at grasshoppers according to his original intent. Does that make sense? So, closing. Are we prophesying the good news? Jesus. Are we decreeing and declaring the truth of the gospel? Do we know what is on God's agenda so we can believe it and speak it? Are we doing... What are we doing with the facts of the finished work? Well, it's time to prophesy over your life and others the mind of Christ. Amen? Heavenly Father... Lord, open our eyes to these truths because this is the gospel. And we are to decree it and declare it over the lives of people, the lost as well as the saved. They all hear the message. That's why Paul said, beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. Anybody that can prophesy and decree and declare this over lives have preached the good news, the glorious truth of Jesus Christ and the finished work. That's the only thing that sets us free because... It's already done 2,000 years ago. God in Christ restored us not only back to God, but to his original intent and purpose. I am not who I used to be. Now, my mind needs to be renewed on that. But in my spirit, I am not who I used to be. I'm a new creation. Some translations, new humanity. We're in God. God is in us. As he is, so are we in this world. And we will not settle for anything less than what that word says. So I want you to get pray. I pray you get that in your spirit this morning. 
that you will not settle for anything less than what that word says about you. And if there's th situations and circumstances in your life that is not God's original intent, then we know how to handle that now. We'll go to decree and declare and prophesy over dry bones. See those things in your life that's wrong as dry bones and start speaking life. Start speaking the good news, the grace of God over that person's life, over that situation, over that circumstance. And do not move, even if nothing changes. You keep preaching and decreeing and declaring God's original intent for that which is facing you. And you're going to see deliverance. You're going to see transformation because the Bible says so. The truth is what sets us free. And that is what we're going to decree and declare no matter how unpopular that may be in our culture and society today. But we're going to love them, but we're going to prophesy the truth over them. And we're not going to let them stay in their mindsets. That's not who you are. I'm sorry. That is not what Christ did 2,000 years ago. You are believing a lie. And we're going to decree and declare truth and grace. And the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of these people. You know, there are, there are situations that many of us are dealing with that we've been dealing with too long. It's not God's original purpose and plan. Start decreeing and prophesying over your problems, the truth. Don't sit there and, and, and just wade in it like in a water, but you're going to change by decreeing that thing. And you're gonna conform it to God's purposes and plans. God will redeem everything in your life and make it part of his plan. He enters in, works all things for good. He works all things for good. He can take the bad and the ugly and the sorrow and the painful and the trial and crisis of your life, enter into it and turn it for good. For his glory and your good. So Lord, we just trust you. You're a magnificent God. All things are possible with you and our eyes are on you and your original intent and purpose. And that is what we're going to decree and declare in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week.